Hi, my name is Daphne Peterson, and I'm Professor and Department Chair of Sociology at the University of North Dakota. And it's my privilege to serve as the immediate past president of AKD. I'd like to thank you for joining us and offer a warm welcome to our centennial celebration. We're celebrating 100 years of Alpha Kappa Delta, the International Honor Society in Sociology. The mission of AKD is to acknowledge and promote excellence in the study of sociology, the research of social problems, and other social and intellectual activities as will lead to improvement in the human condition. Our letters, AKD, stand for Anthropon, Catamanthenine, Diaconison, or to investigate humanity for the purpose of service. It was Emery Bogardus in 1920 at the University of Southern California who identified this mission and the values that we stand for today. And I think he would agree that the work we do as sociologists is always, if not now, even more pressing. So you're in for a real treat. I'm excited to share with you a full program as are the other AKD members who are with us today, members of council. We're gonna begin with highlighting some programming that AKD offers for both students and faculty. And then we'll move into the presentation by our distinguished lecturer, Dr. David Embrick. And I know you're in for a real treat. After taking your questions, we'll then highlight our current award winners. So thank you again for joining us. We're excited to share this program with you and to see where the next 100 years of AKD go and how they unfold. So I know that it will be good. I'm Dennis McSevney, Professor and Dean Emeritus for the University of New Orleans and Alpha Kappa Delta's current president. And I've been a member of AKD since 1968. On November 12, 1920, Emory S. Bogardus, Chair of the Department of Sociology at the University of Southern California, convened a meeting of 14 sociology faculty and graduate students and launched Alpha Kappa Delta. They met at the home of Ms. Hazel Leggett, a graduate of Stanford University and an MA candidate in sociology at USC. The group included three full-time faculty members, two lecturers in sociology, and nine graduate students. The graduate students were selected by the faculty, as Bogardus wrote, because of the quality of the work that they were doing and their abiding interest in sociology. Sociology in the United States emerged during a period of rapid change in American society. The 1862 Morrell Act created land-grant colleges. That led to the founding of state colleges and universities across the country and made higher education accessible to more people, not just the children of the wealthy. Following these events, interest in sociology rose significantly. John Lewis Gillen noted in his 1926 American Sociological Society presidential address, quote, it has been suggested that the war left this country with many problems which challenged the attention of men. It had rocked the social structure of our people to its foundations. It had challenged thinking men to a reconsideration of the fundamental problems of government and social relationships. Like every important war, the Civil War and its after results disturbed the settled status of classes and raised questions concerning settled opinions. And to thinking minds presented the challenge of re-examining some of our fundamental notions. It was a time when social readjustment was necessary and new relationships had to be established." End quote. In 1876, William Grant Sumner, professor of political and social sciences at Yale, taught what is believed to be the first course in sociology in the United States. Shortly thereafter, in 1883, Lester F. Ward published Dynamic Sociology. Sociology courses and then departments grew slowly across the country. Emmy Bogardus was a prominent figure in sociology during the first half of the 20th century. Born in 1882, he received his BA in 1908 at Northwestern, where he became a member of Phi Beta Kappa. After earning his MA at Northwestern, he completed his PhD at the University of Chicago in 1911. Bogardus immediately joined the faculty at the University of Southern California as an assistant professor. In 1915, Bogardus founded and became head of the Department of Sociology at Southern Cal. 
making it one of only about 100 colleges and universities offering sociology courses. Bogartis and others in sociology department saw the need for faculty and advanced students to come together regularly to present new research problems, new methods, and data. Bogartis referred to as kind of super seminar in which all members of the department interstimulate each other in their research programs. Bogartis arrived at that initial meeting of what would become Alpha Kappa Delta with a tentative constitution and bylaws based on those of Phi Beta Kappa. The name Alpha Kappa Delta was chosen because the letters represent the first letters of the three classical Greek words that embody the function of the society. Anthropos, meaning mankind, katamanthano, meaning to examine closely or acquire knowledge, and diakonio, meaning to do service. Simply, Alpha Kappa Delta does social research in order that the welfare of the human race may be served. With the success of AKD Southern Cal and the growth of college honor societies in a variety of disciplines across the country, Bogartis wrote to colleagues at the University of Wisconsin, Northwestern University, and the University of Kansas, who each formed campus chapters. At the 1924 American Sociological Society meeting, AKD's Alpha Chapter and the three new chapters formed the United Chapters of Alpha Kappa Delta. By 1930, AKD had grown to 20 chapters. In the years to follow, AKD expanded across the country. Its membership grew steadily. Today, there are 690 AKD chapters across the country, more than 4,000 active members, and approximately 135,000 women and men who have been inducted as lifetime members of Alpha Kappa Delta. The members of Alpha Kappa Delta are united in our purpose to promote excellence in scholarship in the study of sociology, the research of social problems, and such other social and intellectual activities as will lead to improvement in the human condition. We celebrate Alpha Gabba Delta's 100th anniversary. Hello, I'm Bethany Titus, the Executive Director for Alpha Kappa Delta and work in the Executive Office located in Syracuse, New York. I'm also the representative for the Association of College Honor Societies. Alpha Kappa Delta offers many student and chapter programs to help support its mission. Some of the student benefits we offer are an undergraduate and graduate paper competition where winners receive a cash prize and reimbursement for travel expenses incurred when attending the American Sociological Association's annual conference. We also offer a student member research travel grant for members who are presenting a paper or poster at a regional sociology conference. We have a mentorship program that provides an opportunity for members to connect and network with other AKD members and professionals virtually. It's especially beneficial to students looking for guidance on applying to graduate school, doctoral students on the job market, and faculty navigating promotion and tenure. Some of the chapter programs we offer include our initiation speaker grant and symposium funding. We also offer the Emory Bogardus Chapter of the Year Award, which recognizes chapter achievement in fulfilling AKD's mission. And new this year is the Chapter Funding Award to implement AKD's anti-racism policy. We hope for this award to help enable chapters to identify and implement meaningful change on their campuses and in their communities as called for in our Statement on Racism in America. We offer several other programs for our sociology community, including our new graduate student lounge. This will be a monthly meeting with discussions, seminars, or workshops for graduate students by graduate students. This is open to all graduate students in the sociology field. And of course, check out our teaching and learning workshops that we are currently offering monthly via Zoom in order to help advance the quality of teaching in the discipline of sociology. Hello, my name is Dr. Cameron Lippard. I serve, along with Dr. Scott Carter, as a co-editor of Sociological Inquiry. On behalf of Dr. Scott Carter and myself, we'd like to congratulate AKD on their 100th anniversary. Congratulations! For 92 years, Sociological Inquiry has been the premier journal of AKD, committed to exploring the human condition and all of its social and cultural complexity. SI publishes top-notch manuscripts focusing on original research, 
research notes, methodological and theoretical overviews, as well as book reviews. Throughout our history, SI has published manuscripts that focus on a significant variety of topic, topics, including but not limited to racism, sexism, warfare, immigration, crime and deviance, applied sociology, and much, much more. As one of the top journals of sociology, we hope you will consider sending your next manuscript to us. For more information on how you can publish with us, please visit our website or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Again, happy anniversary to AKD. May you see another 100 years of sociological excellence. Hello, I'm Brianne Davila, Associate Professor of Sociology at Cal Poly Pomona, Chair of the Awards Committee and Region 9 Representative. Alpha Kappa Delta is thrilled to announce this year's AKD-sponsored Minority Fellow, Uriel Serrano. Uriel is a doctoral candidate in sociology and critical race and ethnic studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in sociology from California State University, Los Angeles. His areas of specialization are gender and masculinity, children and youth, social movements and youth activism, sociology of education, and Du Boisian sociology. In his dissertation, Coming of Age in South Central, Gender Ideologies, Youth Activism, and the Carceral State, Uriel examines how gender ideologies, gender socialization, activism, youth groups, and the history of South Central intersect and mediate Black and Latino young men's contemporary experiences. His work is guided by community-engaged methods, speaks to theories of masculinity, and draws upon ethnography, surveys, and document analysis. Uriel has published his work in Race, Ethnicity, and Education, Association of Mexican-American Educators Journal, and Sociological Perspectives. As a community-engaged scholar, he's also published reports for the Environmental and Regional Equity Program at USC and led program evaluations for the California Endowment and UC Santa Cruz's Student Success Equity Research Center. Congratulations, Uriel, and thank you for your very important work. Hi, my name is Melinda Messinio, and I am the Vice President of Alpha Kappa Delta, the International Sociological Honor Society. And it is with a great honor and a great pleasure that I get to introduce our centennial distinguished presenter and lecturer, David Embrick. Dr. Embrick is just such an amazing public sociologist and embodies the values and aspirations that Alpha Kappa Delta holds so dear. He was the one of the first um, AKD, American Sociological Association's Minority Fellows, past president of the Southwestern Sociological Association, current vice president of the Society for the Study of Social Problems, and current president of the Association for Humanist Sociology, really living those values as a passionate and compassionate sociologist. In addition, he serves as the founding co-editor of Sociology of Race and Ethnicity, the founding book series editor of Sociology of Diversity with Bristol University Press, and is a founding book series co-editor of Sociology of Race and Ethnicity um, with the Georgia University Press. And I'll also mention that he is a very active co-editor and reviewer for the association's journal, Sociological Inquiry. Um, you may know that Dr. Embrick's research centers largely on the impact of contemporary forms of racism on people of color. And while most of his research is what is labeled as diversity ideology and inequalities in the business world, he's published on race and education, racial microaggressions, and the impact of schools, welfare, and prisons on people of color, and as well as issues of sex discrimination. Um, he's published widely in a, a number of journals, including the American Behavioral Scientist, uh, the Critical Sociology, Race and Society, Sex Roles, Social Problems, Social Forum, and Symbolic Interactionism, among many, many others. And he's also very active in presenting his work and has presented at over 125 different venues, both academic and public 
And we are just so honored uh, to have Dr. David Embrick doing our Centennial Distinguished Lecture today. And we are so pleased that he's part of the Alpha Kappa Delta community. Dr. Embrick, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for all you've done for Alpha Kappa Delta. And thank you so much for bringing sociology beyond academia. So it is my honor to present Dr. David Embrick. Thank you so much um, and happy birthday. Happy centennial. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I imagine there are all kinds of feelings happening right now. And I imagine some of those feelings include surprise, doubt, anger, sadness, confusion, and more. And while it's still too early to make complete sense of the 2020 election, one thing remains clear. The roots of white supremacy run deep in our country and is complicated by its intersections with other systems of oppression, such as class and gender. Our denials about the realities of systemic and anti-Black racism does not change the fact that it exists and continues to affect Black, Indigenous, and other people of color in profound ways. And we are witnesses to how racism plays out in our everyday lives. Indeed, technology has allowed us the ability to provide striking and unwavering proof, like never before, that in the US, the lives of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color do not matter as much as their white counterparts. Even as some would continue to downplay, minimize, or explain away the egregious racial violence and oppression that happen and are happening before our very eyes. Certainly, we are witnessing another moment in time where whites and white allies are reacting against challenges that seek to remedy existing racial and other inequities, challenges made against the white status quo, as well as to our country's growing racial diversity. My colleagues and I have published on what we have labeled the notion of white lash, which we define as individual, institutional, and structural countermeasures against the dismantling of white supremacy as it intersects with other systems of oppression or actions, real or imagined, that seek to remedy existing racial inequities. This election provides some insight into what many social scientists have been arguing for decades, that racism is deeply embedded in our society and our organizations. And I mention all of this because it forms a backdrop, just one, for what I wanna talk about next, racism in higher education, particularly for black, indigenous, and other people of color, but also for scholars whose areas of interest or expertise critically engages with systems and structures of oppression. Here, I'm not the first, I'm not even the few who have written or talked about racism in academia. So I do not wanna spend time reiterating what others have already published and what we already know, that racism has been and still is a major issue we ought to contend with, and it continues to be the elephant in the room that we ignore. That said, I wanna emphasize a few points that we might pay particular attention to and that might help us think of some ways to move forward. First, more and more research are coming out to address how organizations are not race neutral bureaucratic structures. Most recently, Professor Victor Ray published a piece in a 2019 issue of the American Sociological Review titled A Theory of Racialized Organizations. And I highly recommend that you pick up this piece and, and read it if you haven't already. He argues in this piece for the need for a new theory set on four tenets that undergird organizations as racialized structures. These tenets are one, that racialized organizations enhance or diminish the agency of racial groups. Two, that racialized organizations legitimate the unequal distribution of resources. Three, that whiteness is a credential. And four, the decoupling of former rules from organizational practice is often racialized. In other words, as noted racism scholar Eduardo Bonilla Silva has often argued after a social formation is racialized, its normal dynamics always include a racial component. Thus, again, organizations are not race neutral, but in fact, help to reproduce the current racial and social order through racialized mechanisms and other mechanisms of oppression that often stay hidden through policies and practices that are often seen as legitimized as race neutral. They are, as Professor Wendy Moore has argued, white spaces. What this ultimately means is that by focusing our attention on overt manifestations of prejudice and bigotry, on old fashioned Jim Crow type in your face racism, we miss out on fully understanding how it is that in 2020, 
that racism continues to be a central factor in the lives and well-being of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Because we tend to view this overt nastiness as the individual culprits without realizing that we all participate in a racialized social system and racialized organizations to some extent. That is, systemic and anti-Black racism, as Professor Bonilla Silva has remarked, are fueled just as much by overt white supremacists as by so-called liberal whites, and to some lesser extent by people of color, who are also socialized and participate in our society. Now, this does not mean that individual racist bigots do not play a role in how racism operates in academia. They certainly do. We have overwhelming social science data on this. The experiences of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who are faculty, staff, students, or even administrators gives us tons of insight into how even one racist individual can wreak serious havoc on one's psychological, physiological well-being. In a piece I published in 27 with colleagues David L. Brunsma and Jean Shin, we noted that while the experiences of graduate students in higher education varied, with the major concern being lack of mentorship, the graduate school experience of students of color were rife with racism, discrimination, and daily racial and other forms of microaggressions within their departments, as well as in their colleges or universities. Students of color mentioned assumptions of criminality, treatment of second-class citizens, underestimation of personal abilities, and cultural racial isolation, lack of mentorship, and feelings of not belonging. In a more recent publication with a team of colleagues that included David Brunsma from the previous, uh, from the study I previously mentioned, after engaging with senior scholars of color who we label uh, for this project, the mothers and fathers of sociology of race and ethnicity, we found that for many of them, these forms of racism continued long past their graduate school years and throughout their careers. And similarly, I have tons of anecdotes of racism from my undergraduate and graduate school years at Texas A&M University of both overt and more subtle colorblind racism. Let me just give you one example of what I'm talking about. This was toward the tail end of my undergraduate career. And to be honest, I never thought about graduate school as a viable option. It just, it wasn't for me, it didn't click for me. Um, I didn't even think I could make it. But I had a persistent mentor who kept pushing me, insisting that I was very much graduate school material and that I should pursue a graduate degree in sociology. And so after a long series of back and forth, I agreed that I would take the GRE exam. I would ask some of my professors for letters of recommendations and we would see where it took me. I was told that I should speak to the undergraduate advisor in the sociology department at Texas A&M. At that time, there was an undergraduate academic advisor who met with undergraduates about the degree plans, career opportunities and the, and the like. It's a little bit different than what I'm used to now at UConn where the faculty sort of share the load um, of advising undergraduate students. The person in that position, when I went to see them about going to graduate school was a graduate student in the sociology department, a white woman. I remember being pretty happy and musing to myself about what graduate school would look like. Could I really make it there? What careers I might pursue with an advanced degree? And so I went to this person's office, knocked on the door and I was told to come in. As I entered the room, the person was looking down at their desk and they asked me, how could they help me? I said I was considered graduate school and I was advised by my mentor to stop by the office and talk about and get information about getting into the graduate program at Texas a I vividly remember at that instant that the person looked up at me and without looking at my academic record, without asking me about my grades, without referring to any additional references or pieces of information, said to me point blank, quote, I really don't think you're a graduate school material. And that was the end of the conversation. I left the office feeling angry and depressed, and I went straight to my mentor's office to tell him what happened. Obviously, I made it to graduate school, got my PhD, and here I am to tell the story. But I, I will freely admit it took a lot of work for my mentor to get it into my head that this was racist as hell, and I was indeed graduate school material. I remember being ready to quit the day, that day. And several things occurred to me soon after, and I've been pondering that moment and many others ever since. First, I would not have made it to graduate school without great mentorship. For me and for many students and even faculty of color, this has nothing to do with intellectual capacity, but rather having mental support to make it in white spaces. And second, in the best case scenarios where one has great mentors, racial microaggressions and other forms of discrimination get shared in ways that affect 
genuinely affect both parties, the mentee and the mentor. This transference of racial stressor means that the deleterious and cumulative effects of racism do not just affect one person, but might in fact affect both or many people as they remember similar racist incidences that have occurred to them in the past, or they can relate to the racism in similar ways. But as I mentioned previously, it's not just about the overt and often pointed to racist culprits. It's also those who would deem themselves as white allies or advocates yet remain bystanders when racial incidents occur, or who would explain away or challenge scholarship or views on racial health disparities, the need to dismantle Confederate statues, the significance of systemic racism or black employment, or who would feel the need to police or discipline black indigenous and other people of color for barbecuing or bird watching in the park or jogging in a neighborhood or who all think that they're beyond race by proclaiming that all lives matter, or who would think to white splain as a way of being helpful. To understand how racism works in a greater society, you have to understand that everyone participates in a racialized social system. Beyond the individual level racism, however, are the racial mechanisms within organizations that help keep the racial and social order churning. And this I refer back to Victor Ray's piece on racialized organizations. In academia, policies and practices that work to maintain the status quo are central to understanding how racism continues to work in higher education. The fact that we are still mostly, that we still mostly do not question the mostly white and male curriculum that is taught to students is and continues to be problematic. By not decolonizing the curriculum, the organization sends a strong message about who is regarded as important, intellectual, inspirational, and who is not. Issues of recruitment and retention of faculty of color affect many college and universities and are just and are sometimes explained in racist ways. We just can't find qualified people of color. People of color are greedy and all about the money and they're not really wanting to be at university X or Y. So we can't keep them. There's a dearth of faculty of color in leadership positions. Students and faculty of color asked to navigate often hostile racial campus environments. Students and faculty of color are asked to accept certain logics, methods, theories, philosophies, epistemologies, and the like as given, as race neutral, as real science. Critical knowledge in fields of study, such as Africana studies, critical Latinx studies, Afro-pessimism, Afrofuturism, for example, and the critical scholars of color have been and continue to be denied, even as we address this uh, in uh, many of our organizations, right? Uh, for some reason, uh, we've put Du Bois on a pedestal where he rightly belongs, but we forget that there are tons of other scholars of color, especially women scholars of color who have contributed. Right? Anna Julia Cooper, Ida B. Wells, they seem to be, have been left out um, in the dust. Students of color are expected to work harder. Faculty of color are expected to do more, often with less resources. As Professor Adia Harvey Wingfield argued in her 2019 book, Flatlining, racialized organizations such as colleges and universities often engage in what she calls racial outsourcing, leaving folks of color to do the brunt of the equity work in connecting organizations to communities of color. We see this in many instances where the few leaders of color are in diversity and equity positions, sometimes tenured to an academic department, often not though. And we know that many universities and colleges, no matter how many legislative bodies would argue otherwise, are not bastions of progressiveness. In a study by Professor Ted Thornhill, he found that often admissions would take an active role in sifting through the applications of students of color to weed out anyone who they might deem to be a threat to the status quo. That is, if there were signs of student activism for social and racial justice, your application was unlikely to be accepted or less likely to be accepted than if you showcase little inclination to disrupting the status quo, in which case you are more likely to be accepted. But there's more. Individual prejudice and bigotry and racialized organizations are governed by white supremacy at the macro level. White lash doesn't just occur at the local level, but it's often influenced and bolstered by economic, political, and other structural forces that aim to dismantle threats to the status quo. We've seen this recently with the Trump's administration's move to end critical race theory and white privilege trainings in all the federal agencies. And what's telling about this isn't the blatant move itself, but the overall silence surrounding the move. Um, I, can't, I can't tell you how many times I've sort of thought about this and just like, why, why isn't there a bigger movement uh, to counter this? Not just by academics, but at large, right? Of course, we see, we've seen sort of the voting patterns and you can sort of understand partly why. 
We see this with the waning of white participation in Black Lives Matter, alongside the growth of all lives or Blue Lives Matter movements. The implications are real and intense and disastrous for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color in general, but particularly in academia. And so here we are. What do we do? How do we proceed? Are there real solutions to dealing with racism in academia? Sure. Right? At the individual level, there have been tons of written on this. And I would implore you to check out research from professors Johnny Williams, Crystal Fleming, Tanya Golash Boza, James M. Thomas, J. Scott Carter, Melissa Weiner, Cameron Lippert, Bumi K. Tsukor. There's just countless others who write and research on racism and other forms of oppression. But one might begin with having an honest conversation and self reflection about the realities of racism in our country. As professors Leslie Picka and Joe Fagan, and more recently, Professor Ibram Kendi have noted, we need less bystanders and more anti-racists who will step up to the plate and challenge individual bigotry and prejudice and anti-Black and systemic racism whenever and wherever you can. We can be better mentors and we can pay this forward. And we don't have to do this alone. In fact, we shouldn't. As Professor Johnny Williams has argued and quoted from Octavia Butler, defeat is the norm, resilience is the test but only after we learn from what we've experienced, seek new unexpected knowledge and work together and rebuild ignoring failed systems. We need to work collectively to dismantle all forms of racism. Beyond, moving beyond individuals, we need organizations to make real changes, acknowledge their role in racialized social system and think hard about how to dismantle their racialized foundations. We need organizations to be leaders in making real progressive changes rather than symbolic gestures, often under the guise of diversity and inclusion. We need organizations to recognize the overt and hidden issues of racism and address them forthright, to put resources where needed to level the playing field for scholars of color who often have less resources than their white counter counterparts or given less opportunities than their white counterparts. And so I'm forever grateful to AKD for providing me with the ASA Minority Fellowship at a time that was crucial for me in my academic career. I can't say that I would not have been successful without it, but it put me in both the financial and mental state that gave me the freedom to do the research I wanted to do, and more importantly, provided me with a vast network of support that I continue to rely upon today. And don't get me wrong, I am not absolving AKD of the need to be self-reflexive. They're a racialized organization in a racialized social system. But I think it's okay to recognize that while also working toward changes for the better. And to that, and I appreciate the very important part in contributing. Um, apologies. Um, to the ASA Minority Fellowship. And I know there's lots more to be done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and another round of applause to Dr. David Embrick, everyone. So thank you so much for your time and uh, bringing this uh, to us. I'm gonna be um, bringing questions from the chat to you. And so the first question we have is, can you describe how your research informs your mentoring? Oh my goodness. Yeah, well, I mean, um... <laughs> I think it works both ways, right? I think my, my uh, uh, you know, the ways that I've been mentored, right, um, informs how I mentor others and also informs my research. Um, but, um, you know, I mentioned before that, um, that, that I, I mean, I, I have anecdote after anecdote, as would any um, person of color that you talk to about sort of uh, experiences of racism within higher education or within life, right? Um, um, certainly, certainly um, they're, you know, um, they're different than say my black colleagues or my Latino colleagues, but they're there nonetheless, right? And, um, you know, early on in my, in my academic career, I remember, this is when I was an undergraduate, I um, uh, was uh, at Texas A&M and I was working 60 hours uh, a week and sort of non-traditional and, um, and you know, I missed a bunch of final exams, and I didn't do very well, so I was I was suspended from Texas A&M. And I remember going back to the admissions office and saying, you know, I I really I really want to give I want to be given a second chance, right? Um, and um, I, I can't remember what exactly was said, but there was a lot of hemming and hawing about how I didn't really look like a serious academic, or you know, I wasn't you know, the grades matter and blah blah blah. And and you know, um, after a, a, a little. Uh, back and forth, you know, um, they basically said, look, um, it, 
go back to go to go to um, go to a junior college and um, get a degree and come back to us, right? Um, with good grades. I said fine. So I went to the local junior college. The thing was, I already had a undergraduate. I, you know, I started my my academic career at a junior college, and I already had an associate's degree. So this would have been a second associate's degree. Uh, but I remember thinking, uh, and this is also what brought me into sociology, that um, as I was taking some of these classes, I learned a few things. Um, one, um, there was a professor who um, I uh, had taken a class and didn't do very well at Texas A&M, and he was also my professor at the junior college, and he was like, what happened? And I said, well, you know, I just, um, I was working late night, I overslept, and he was like, why didn't you just call me? Why didn't you just call me? and, and um, just tell me, and we would have, we were to rearrange the final. And I had no clue, I was a working class student, I had no clue that you could do this. I was just kind of like, you know, you, you screwed up, you just kind of move on, right? Um, and the other thing was I met a bunch of students in the junior college who basically had dropped out of Texas A&M through partying. And um, they were told that they just needed to go to junior college for a semester, bring up their grades and they can come back. And I sort of are, you know, at that moment, I realized, wow, there's some serious um, major acts of discrimination that are going on. And this has sort of spurred me um, to get into sociology. Um, and um, once I got into sociology, you know, um, it became it became apparent. A lot of things became apparent about how 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 racism works, how classism works, how homophobia and transphobia works, how how sexism works and the intersections of all those systems of oppression. And I also started to realize that, you know, um, at some point, you know, if it weren't for sort of my mentors, I never would have, I never would have made it to graduate school. Um, not, not intellectual, right? Not Nothing about intellectual capabilities, but, but just navigating murky waters, dealing with the emotional stressors, right? And I sort of told myself that, um, and, you know, and my research kept informing me like this was the case, right? That, that, uh, mentorship was uh, vital importance and so and so that has sort of informed um, my decisions moving forward ever since um, early on in graduate school whether or not uh, you know how to pay it forward in what ways to pay it forward um, and and why it's really important for me to um, you know um, stop and think before I say no to students especially students of color who are asking for my help whether they're in the department or outside the department and I will say like Anybody who's in this position, any any person of color who's a faculty sort of know when you go into university and you're one of the very few fa faculty of color, um, what happens is that, um, you know, first you get a line of students out your door um, who don't feel comfortable going to other faculty and these are fa students of color. And so you end up doing a brunt of service work and, and, and work with students that your colleagues don't have to do, which sort of really can interfere with tenure and all these other things, right? Because you, you have to take the time. But then soon the word spreads because the university is problematic. It's not just the department, right? And so you get a line of students. So when I was at Loyola University for 10 years, I had students coming to my door just wanting to talk who were in other programs, in other departments, not just in the sociology department. Um, and that's, that is also sort of, you know, stuck with me. And I, I've been, you know, uh, I've many times where I sort of thought about, well, I really need to sort of protect my time. But at the same time, I sort of remember myself in that position. And if it weren't for my mentors, I probably wouldn't be here. So you know, you're sort of caught in this the dilemma. But yeah, these, these things have informed my work. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it works both ways. I don't know if that really answered the question. I feel like I went off tangent, but I wanted to give sort of a more complicated picture of sort of what, how I think about the importance of mentorship and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, how my, my life has been affected by racism and, and classism and things like that, issues of other issues of oppression. That was phenomenal. I think you, we have another question that asks, how do you navigate or manage the tension between working within a system that you find to be so problematic? So how do you manage the tension of being in a system that is so biased? Everybody does things differently. I write. I write. I, I choose what to write, when to write, what to write about. I made um, a decision a long time ago, even against the advice of some of my advisors, um, you know, much early on that um, that I would not um, I would not kowtow to sort of, you know, um, um, watering down the truth, so to speak. Right. And so, you know, I I I spend my time um, um, trying to write the truth as I know it sociologically um, about racism and classism and, and so on and so forth and the intersections thereof. Uh, you know, I, I'm not, 
I don't know if it's the right thing to do. I think if I were to give, if I were to give advice on it, uh, you know, my advice is, is, is also complicated because I, I do feel that people need to be themselves, truly be yourselves. But, you know, in a system that is um, racist, sexist, classist, elitist, um, you know, which is academia, um, it's really hard because you have to get tenure. Right. And, you know, the, 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 the saying, the saying is always right. I mean, you can't really help other students of color. You can't help yourself and you can't help uh, the field if you don't get tenure because you won't last very long in academia. Um, and that's true to some extent. That's not necessarily fully true, but that is true to some extent. So you have to sort of figure out um, how to be yourself and how navigate at least until you get, um, so, you know, some kind of security. But even then, right, I mean, the, the, the problem with that um, argument is that, you know, we're finding out more and more that, you know, tenure isn't necessarily a guarantee as well, right? Um, and uh, it's scary. So, um, but I think that if you're, if you're true to yourself, um, then, uh, you know, you have less demons to deal with, I guess, is the best way that I can put it. Thank you. Another question. Um, I'm not particularly familiar with the Minority Fellowship Program. Can you describe what that process and experience is like? The process is different now than it was in the past. The, 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 the Minority Fellowship at the time that I, uh, and I think I was the first to be awarded the AKD, um, ASA Minority Fellowship Program from ASA. But at the, at the time that this happened, this is probably, this is mid-2000s, right? So the most of the uh, most of the minority fellowship program through ASA was funded um, by the um, I, I think it was the National Institute of uh, NIMH grant. It's either NIH or NIMH grant, um, and so AKD was the only um, outside uh, funder um, um, besides that. And then sometime years ago, um, we lost uh, we lost funding from NIH and NIMH. Um, and that, that became sort of, um, I think, a, a little traumatic. Uh, AKD still stuck uh, with them. And we had, and so ASA had to find other um, channels in order to get money. And they did through, through some organizations, through SWS funds one, the Association of Black Sociologists funds another, SSS, uh, I don't think SSS, but the Southwesterns do. Um, so what I'm saying is that when I, when I did it, it was, um, you got funded for three years. You know, uh, and I believe I only took two years before I went into the market, but you got funded for three years. And so these days it's only, it's only, uh, it's limited funding for a year only, right? And so the, the process back then is a little bit different than the process. Now the process back then um, meant that um, people on um, the, the um, you know, on the panel to determine winners were looking for, um, you know, signs of, of, of uh, academic promise, right? You know, the, are you going to be a superstar? Those kind and and also the the work, right? Because it was attached to MIH and I and I, MH, um, you know, uh, folks that were doing uh, you know uh, work in in the health field, you know, like racism and health disparities and things like that. Nowadays, the you know what I tell my own students is that um, it's really about perseverance that 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 you apply um, to get your to get your record in to get your application in. And what the what the what folks are looking for is they're looking for progress between applications one, applications two, or applications three. Now, this doesn't mean that you won't um, you won't um, be selected uh, on your first application, but the chances, because of the way that it's structured, it's more likely that perseverance is going to win. And so, what you want to do is you want to apply, and then you want to make sure in the next year, if you if you don't make it, you want to you want to not be so depressed that you don't apply again the next year or the year after. But you want to keep applying, and you want to make sure that you address in your cover letter and that you have on your CV signs of progress between years one, years two, and years three, right? So that so that the so that the uh, the panelists can look at your record and say, wow, like there's concrete proof here that you are sort of you've been making uh, you've been making progress. Um, and so that's sort of, for me, um, a, a big difference in, in how to do that. Is it nerve wracking? Yeah, it is nerve wracking. But is it is it you know, is it um, it's probably one of the best things that's ever happened to me, honestly. 
Um, the networks were a little bit different for me because I'm part of sort of the AKD network and I'm also part of the ASA Minority Fellowship Program network. And those are ones that have stayed with me forever. And I, I have fond memories. I still keep in touch with uh, you know, the former president um, who was there was Peter Wood and he was the one that sort of gave me an award. And, and I, I can't tell you the, the amount of stories that I have, uh, just things that happened to me first time. I mean, we went to the Ritz Carlton. I had never been, you know, he was like, let's, let's, uh, let's start with some pork. And I was like, pork, what, what are we taught? Like, where, where are we going? And he was like, you know, so, so, you know, there, <laughs> I learned a lot, but, you know, I think, um, yeah, you know, the, the, um, it's, it's definitely worth, um, it's definitely worth the application. It's definitely worth the camaraderie. It's definitely worth the support. Um, and the best thing about it, speaking of mentors, like, you know, uh, we always think that, um, you know, the, the number one thing that you can do for yourself in graduate school is to find a great mentor and supportive mentor. Um, but, you know, the, the, with, the, with, the, with, with this fellowship, the AKD fellowship and ASA, you know, um, you, you, are, you end up being open to a whole host of mentors from all walks of life that sort of are willing, more than willing to help you in every aspect that you can think of. I mean, just reaching out to that network um, was... Um, was also vital for me mentally, as I had a lot of questions about all kinds of things moving forward, um, and even questions like the ones that um, have been asked to me um, just now. Um, I sort of rely on this big network. So, Thank did that address you. the question? I, I feel like there were like some logistical things I needed to like answer, and I didn't. But <laughs> and Tam is on the call as well uh, from ASA. So thank you so much for being here. I don't know if there's anything you want to add about if people want to apply for the fellowship uh, for this coming cycle. Tamara, do you want to take it for just a minute and then we'll bring it back to Dr. Ember? All right, there we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, happy birthday to AKD. <laughs> um, I was just actually having a side chat with Uriel, <laughs> who is our, our uh, AKD MFP fellow, um, just saying, you know, like, I'm so happy and proud of him and so on. Uh, actually, I just wanted to announce that the applications are open as of today for the MFP right. program. So if you all want to apply, please do uh, do that now. Uh, there's lots of information on there. You can also get in touch with me. I'm the new Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at ASA. So uh, MFP is going to be my baby for the next year. Yay. And I'm excited about that. Um, but everything Dr. Embrick just said is true. Uh, we were under NIH. And uh, NIH and NIMH actually got rid of all of their um, minority fellowship type of grants. So we rely on other associations who fund our, our fellows. And we have five fellows that we select each year. But everything that Dr. Emberg said is exactly true. We look for promise, right? And we're looking for those who are well into their PhD program um, for the majority of the selections that we make. And hopefully we can provide you funding. It's only for one year now. I think Dr. Ember, he said it was for three years prior, um, but now it's for one year. Yeah. Um, but hopefully that helps to offset some things for students as well. We ask the institution to waive their tuition. So that's the, the additional thing that you get with uh, the MFP program. Uh, I've also instituted some colloquia that we have throughout the year to help students along because before you were only meeting each other in the beginning of the year when you got the award and at the end when you were exiting. So now we're providing some more enrichment programming throughout the year for fellows. I'm looking forward to reading the new applications that are coming in by January 31st is the deadline and uh, looking forward to our new cohort, but we're really happy with our cohort that we currently have. So Uriel, if you're still online, congratulations. Uh, keep up the good work and to everyone else, good luck with everything this year. And thank you, Dr. David Embrick for uh, the speech that you just gave. It's really enlightening. And um, I'm sure that students walk away from that feeling like they're not alone. So thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So one that I'll offer here to you, Dr. Embrick. Uh, a student shares, uh, I hear a lot about imposter syndrome and I'm not mm. sure how best to respond as a student of color. Do you have any advice? Wow, um, I can definitely relate. Um, 
I think a lot of us feel this way um, because the system makes us feel this way, right? Uh, you know, this is, there's nothing true about it, right? There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing true. Um, you know, the fact that you make it, you made it this far um, is, is proof enough, I think, that, that, that not only that, that you belong um, in academia, um, but, that, but that you, you know, you're just as good as anyone else, if not better. Right. Um, and in fact, I will just say that, you know, given the research that we have in terms of the amount of work, right, double, triple, quadruple work that, that some groups of folks have to work, um, you know, in order to sort of establish the, the kind of normative, um, um, you know, level that other the, in comparison to their counterparts, um, you're actually um, better equipped, right, um, to move forward. And so I, you know, the, 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 the imposter syndrome just to be quite honest with you, I don't think it ever goes away. And I think it's worse when you it intersects, right? When you have the intersections of, 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 of the different positions that you hold in society. For me, um, the hidden injuries of class um, keep cropping up, uh, you know, over and over and over again um, of, of, you know, um, of whether I truly belong. But, you know, the, 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 the thing through it, again, it's, it, it, it's, it's finding a great mentor and it's finding a community that that they can sort of support you because the one thing that will happen to you if you're isolated and alone um, is that, um, you know, uh, imposter syndrome will be the least of your concerns and it will only be, uh, you know, the, the, that issue would only get exacerbated um, by, uh, by existing forms of racism and other, and other um, oppression, you know, as people. It's not just about ignoring you, but, but sort of, you know, um, the, the everyday uh, racial microaggressions that sort of make you feel like you, you don't belong here or make you question, right? Make you question uh, your research, uh, you know, uh, make you question your, you know, the methods that you choose, make you question, make you question everything about even being in graduate school. And it doesn't stop at graduate school. I hate, I, you know, it, uh, it continues on through your career. I can't, <laughs> right? I mean, um, you know, um, again, we have tons of data on sort of faculty of color, like especially pre-tenure faculty um, and the treatment that they receive. Um, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm part of a, um, a group um, that has, that has been um, doing uh, uh, sort of town halls at, at UConn for faculty of color. And, um, you know, we met, and this is quite telling, we met for the first time, like the first faculty of color town hall in the history of UConn. Um, and it was just recently, and there were, um, you know, it wasn't a lot because there's not a lot of faculty of color at UConn, but, you know, the faculty there didn't, didn't really know one another. They were all isolated and they all came with tons of sort of, um, you know, um, um, anecdotes about their experiences. They're sort of the racial microaggressions that they face in the department and the college and, and, and so on. And all of them, really, I mean, they didn't really, you know, some of them didn't call it, um, uh, you know, imposter syndrome, but it, it would, the, the writing was on the wall about how they felt about themselves because of how the experiences they got from other faculty, mostly white faculty. Um, and, you know, um, yeah, so I think the power lies in community building uh, building these strong communities where we can support one another. And if the community doesn't happen in the department and or in your college or university, um, it really is in your best interest to look outside because uh, there is a larger community that's out there. Right? Great, thank you. Great question, yeah. One Still last question. Me. What would the current Dr. Emberick give as advice to David Embrick, as he was starting his college degree today. <laughs> oh my goodness! I mean, do you, how much of the truth do you want? Um, I, I don't know. Immediately, I would be like, go to culinary school. That's really what you should be doing. But um, <laughs> no, I think um, I don't know. Let me. Let me. Let me. Um, you know, I will say for all the for all the things I've said, I mean, I, I you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I have two of the of the best mentors one could possibly have in the business. Um, they were there for me. And I, you know, and part of I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit different um, in the fact that I did all my degrees at Texas A&M. And so, you know, these folks have been with me through thick and thin, um, you know, in, 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 you know, as a non-traditional student and, and then transitioning to a traditional student, um, you know, from the very beginning. And I just, I look, I mean, the, what, I look at my other colleagues, some of them uh, who, who, who weren't, um, 
weren't able to have uh, as great mentors. And I, and I see like what mentorship actually can do, like the impact it can have. Uh, you know, because it's not just it's not just advocating for you at the department level. It's everything. It's 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 really just, you know, um, even those the, those conversations about racism, that sort of that, that the, the mental support, uh, you know, and, and, and everything beyond, um, you know, and um, that makes it really important. Otherwise, you sort you sort of find yourself in the muck. And so, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I've, I've been fortunate. Um, I think. Um, I mean, I, 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 I probably would have wished I, I would have paid more attention to um, sort of the, 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 the logistics of what it actually means to be an academic. Um, you know, I wish I would have read more. Um, I find that um, once you become faculty, um, the reading comes to a halt unless you sort of force it. And you, you have, you, and whether graduate students, I know they grumble all the time. I, I did the same. Um, about their reading load, but you really, uh, graduate school is the, is the moment where you where you where you do, right? Where you get where you dig in deep um, in the literature that you're interested in. Um, you know, I wish um, I would have spent more time, um, you know, um, on methods, and I wish I would have known um, what I know now about, um, you know, that. Um, that we do exist in a world and because it's a racialized social system that these methods these logics these things that i talked about are white centered right they're not they're not the given truth you know i wish i would have spent more time um you know um learning other disciplines and fields right that are associated with sociology you know i i consider myself to be a racism scholar and a sociology of race and ethnicity scholar but but here's the truth to anyone that's studying race and ethnicity um, there is no sociology of race and ethnicity. There isn't. I, I run a journal. I know. <laughs> I know it's called sociology of race and ethnicity. But I think when we when we created a title, we we didn't even know what we were doing. We were trying. We were hoping for this to be created because because the truth is, in the classes that I remember taking, you know, fifty to seventy five percent of the folks that we read that we talked about weren't sociologists. Right. You know, they were they were they were economists. They were historians. They were anthropologists. You know, um, they, they were political scientists. Um, you know, the, the man in Marables and, and the Cornell West and, and company. Right. And so and so, you know, um, race, race and ethnicity is really very much interdisciplinary. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I wish I would have spent more time um, thinking about um, you know, critical uh, Latinx studies and and uh, you know, Africana studies. Even though I'm in the position I am now as a, as a joint position in Africana studies, but also Black futurism and you know those those things that that I, that are now starting to gain um, a little bit more weight with some pushback. But I think very vital because some of the things that we talked about as new, innovative, they've already been done. Like those, they they they've already sort of we just have been denying them. Um, you know, because of uh, you know. Um, the way our, our society is racialized. So, I, so I think I would have, I, I would have liked to have known a lot of information that I know now. Um, but the mentorship, which I think is still really the most important thing that you can think of, that that I, I feel very privileged um, to have great mentors. Um, you know, uh, at a time when I think I needed it most, you know, I'll never forget that for sure. Thank you so much. And what a wonderful like reminder of the importance of mentoring. So this is such a great uh, uh, ending point. So I would like to thank you, Dr. Emberg, for all you have done and continue to do and offer another round of applause for our amazing speaker um, who has been gracious enough to speak again. We're hoping at our face-to-face -face annual meeting uh, in uh, 2021. So we hope that you'll join us again there after continuing the conversation. Um, we're gonna be transitioning now to the award ceremony part of our AKD Centennial Celebration. But I also wanted to mention that AKD is sponsoring a teaching and learning sessions next week. So if you have questions about that, it's happening virtually online. We have more information about how to become part of those teaching and learning sessions. Um, and I just wanna thank you again, Dr. Embrick and everybody who's in on our celebration today. And we're gonna transition to our next segment. So take it away.
Hello, I'm Bruce Day from the Sociology Department of Central Connecticut State University, AKD Region 1 Representative and Undergraduate Paper Award Committee Chair. I have the honor of presenting this year's Undergraduate Paper Awards, but first I would like to thank my fellow committee members, Brianne Davila of Cal, Cal Poly Pomona and Jason Alsperger of Arkansas Tech University for all their hard work reviewing the papers. With over 50 submissions from student researchers around the country, we were thrilled to see the level of scholarship our AKD members are achieving. Starting with a third place winner, Bryn Morgan from Colorado College submitted her paper, Coercive Control and Physical Violence, College Students Experience of Intimate Partner Violence. In this paper, Bryn explored the levels of intimate partner violence among college students. She found high levels of physical and non-physical violence, but with no reported difference between women and men. She points out that this gender symmetry contradicts past feminist research and suggests that new methodological approaches be developed to study intimate partner violence, particularly in the college setting. The second place winner is Dan Chai from Washington University in St. Louis. His paper titled, Navigating the Bottom of the Dating Totem Pole, Politics of Exclusion Among Asian American Men, explores how college-aged Asian American men navigate feelings of exclusion from the dating world and how they respond to exclusion in terms of their dating preferences. His findings illuminate how gendered racial hierarchies are imposed on Asian American men and the ways individuals react and respond to such hierarchies. In the first place winner is Paige Toop, from Western Washington University. She submitted the paper, Beyond Thoughts and Prayers, Understanding Mass Violence Through an Investigation of Masculinity in the White Nationalist Movement. In this paper, Page examines the connection between mass violence and the current conceptualization of masculinity. Using an analysis of forums on the white nationalist website, stormfront.org, she develops three archetypes to better understand how masculinity and violence interact with an extremist movement. Congratulations to all the winners of the 2020 undergraduate paper competition, and we hope you will continue your contributions to the research and scholarship of sociology and stay lifelong members of Alpha Kappa Delta. Hi. I'm Gail Murphy Geis, professor in the sociology department of Colorado College and the region eight representative on the Alpha Kappa Delta Council. I was also chair of the graduate student paper competition last year, which was great fun for me since I get to teach only undergrads. This year, there were quite a few notable papers, but the three winners all really stood out to everyone who read them. Before I announce those winners, I want to thank those who served on the committee with me last year, Raquel Bergen, Region 3 representative from St. Joseph's University, and past president of AKD, Michelle Lee Cosimar from Elizabethtown College. Let's start with a third place winner. This year, that honor went to Kristen Kelly of Indiana University in Bloomington. Her paper entitled, Who Can Afford to Keep Their Last Name? Gender, Economic Resources, and Marital Name Choice, considers the differential consequences faced by those who break gendered marital naming norms with a focus on income. Among her findings, she discovered that norm-breaking women are viewed as less likable than women who change their names, while norm-breaking men are thought of as lower status than men in conventionally named couples. Second place went to Sadie Ridgway from Washington State University. Her paper, The Weight of Stigma, Weight Status, Bullying, and Well-Being in Adolescence, explore some of the consequences of larger body size for adolescent well-being, such as the association between weight status and bullying victimization as related to gender and race or ethnicity. She was able to specifically identify one's body image as a very important but little studied factor. And finally, this year's first place winner was Maria Duenas from the University of California, Merced. Her paper entitled, Three Discursive Mechanisms, 
Racial and Ethnic Socialization in Middle-Class Latinx Families, examines how Latinx families talk internally about racial and cultural identity and racism. Her work looks closely at how racial discourses unfold in those families, and by doing so, she contributes to our understanding of how both racial and ethnic oppression and resistance unfold in those everyday interactions. Congratulations to all three winners. Although we didn't get to meet you in person this year in San Francisco, I hope that chance will come soon. Based on the quality of your work, I'm sure we'll be hearing more from you in the future. AKD is pleased to present this year's Emory Begardis Chapter of the Year Award to the University of Central Arkansas. UCA recognizes and celebrates its AKD students at the end of semester departmental awards day, the AKD initiation ceremony, and the College of Liberal Arts Honors Convocation. Members of UCA's AKD chapter have presented their scholarship and research at the Arkansas Sociological and Anthropological Association's annual meeting, the Arkansas Sociological and Anthropological Society's annual undergraduate symposium, and the Midwest Sociological Society's annual meeting. They've organized workshops crucial to students' professional development on topics such as graduate school, constructing CVs, interview techniques, and futures for sociology majors. They've hosted guest speakers on important sociological topics such as gun violence and environmental justice and sociological socials known as tailgateology at their university's football games. They are also very involved in the community, having engaged in service with the Faulkner County Homelessness Task Forum, Deliver Hope, a nonprofit that seeks to engage at-risk youth in Faulkner County, Arkansas, and the Children's Advocacy Alliance Festival of Chairs, a fundraiser supporting child victims of abuse and neglect in Central Arkansas. Congratulations to the University of Central Arkansas and their chapter representative, Dr. Douglas George. Thank you for promoting such excellence in sociology. Hi, my name is Daphne Peterson, and I am Professor of Sociology and Department Chair at the University of North Dakota. I serve as the immediate past president of AKD, and it is my honor and great privilege to announce AKD's first ever Triple Threat Award. And our winner of that award is Frankie from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. I first came in contact with Frankie at the Midwest Sociological Society Teaching and Learning Workshops, where she had received the fellowship, the Teaching and Learning Fellowship, and she went on to do that again. Now she helps organize and co-lead those workshops. In 2019, Frankie earned the first place award in AKD's graduate student paper competition. And that fine work was published just this year in Sociological Inquiry, the journal sponsored by AKD. Her work, Queering Menstruation, is available for you to read. We're so delighted to help celebrate the accomplishments of Frankie, and I hope you'll join me in congratulating her today. I have the privilege of wrapping up today's 100th anniversary event. First, thanks to David Emmerich for being Alpha Kappa Delta's centennial speaker. Congratulations to all the students, both undergraduate and graduate, who submitted their work to the paper awards competitions, and especially the winners. And a special thanks to the faculty members who worked with and advised the students who submitted papers. I also want to offer my congratulations to the winner of the Emory Bogardus Chapter of the Year Award. Thanks to each of AKD's chapter advisors across the country. You are the heart and soul and engine that keeps AKD going. Thanks to Alpha Kappa Delta's Centennial Committee that organized the activities that have been ongoing throughout 2020, AKD's Centennial Year. This anniversary celebration is just the culmination of a year's worth of anniversary events and the beginning of our second 100 years. I want to give special thanks on behalf of myself and AKD to Daphne Peterson, AKD's immediate past president, who served as our president through most of our centennial anniversary year and chaired our centennial committee. 
Dr. Peterson represented Region 8 and AKD's council from 2010 to 2016 when she became president-elect. She served as AKD's president from 2018 to 2020 and will continue as past president through 2022. Daphne has served on many committees during her years of service on AKD's council. She has been an organizer and facility for AKD's teaching and learning workshops in her region. As president, she chaired Alpha Kappa Delta's Centennial Planning Committee and has been integral to the planning of today's event. Dr. Peterson has been fundamental to the growth of Alpha Kappa Delta. Her leadership and strong support enabled AKD to flourish, even during this most unusual and difficult year. If we were meeting face to face, I'd ask you to join me in a round of applause thanking Daphne for her service on AKD's Council for the past decade. Thanks, Daphne. Thanks to everyone at AKD's Council who gives their time, energy, and wisdom because they care about the mission of AKD. And all of these efforts are pulled together by our Executive Director, Bethany Titus. AKD's success in the past, today, and in the future lies with our members. Your energy and commitment in the work being done by the next generation of sociologists makes me confident that AKD will thrive as it enters its second century. I know Emory Bogardas would be proud to see that we are still fulfilling his purpose of 100 years ago, to promote excellence in scholarship, in the study of sociology, the research of social problems, and such other social and intellectual activities as will lead to improvement in the human condition. Thanks to everyone who joined us today in the centennial celebration.